And once again, I want to welcome you to the April 10th, 2020 Stegen Community Forum Call. For many of you who have been attending these calls in our live series, you realize that we have been doing our best to build from one call to the next. And so I'd like to go back and really appreciate our first forum two weeks ago, which was Andy Eby. And Andy Eby came in with this invitation for all of us within the Stegen community and outside of our community as leaders to really move from this place of defense to offense. And Andy brought the very provocative idea of hashtag offense. How can we step into unknown territory and bring the courage necessary to do that so that we actually start to act? And if you think about this thematically, this first call from Andy was a call to action. We built upon that with last week's call with Sean McGinnis. And Sean McGinnis actually invited us to experience this idea of a call to relating, not a call to action, but that once we're in action, how do we relate with those in our life in a way that best serves? And in that particular call, we really explored with Sean this idea that today in the marketplace is not a time to extract, but rather a time to serve. Not a time to be opportunistic, but rather a time to be in relationship. And Sean gave us some really beautiful questions that will allow us to seek to understand how people are. How are they engaging this, uh, this difficult time? And as leaders, how can we ultimately be there to serve them? So week one, a call to action. Week two, a call to relating. And as we move into today's exploration with Vid Deva, Stegen's religious scholar, we're going to actually take advantage of the idea of Good Friday, which is when we recorded this call, and we're actually going to talk about this idea of a call to deepening, a call to action, a call to relating, and now a call to deepening. And how can we actually go in into the interior parts of ourselves and find the sacred dimensions of leadership? And how can we realize that this source is a place from which we can bring even more of our own authenticity as leaders, more of our own effectiveness as leaders? And with that, I'm going to hand off with deep appreciation for what you're about to experience, which is Vid Deva exploring the call to deepening. Thank you very much. It is so good to see all of you today. And I wanna thank you very, very much for the investment of your time, your energy, and your attention in these calls and with our community. I wanna begin with the most important thing I have to say, which is in addition to listening to what I'm gonna share with you today, please pay attention to how you're impacted by what you hear. That as far as I'm concerned, the way that you're stirred, the way that you're moved by what you hear is as or more important than anything I'm gonna say. That everything I'm gonna say is just my humble attempt to ring the bell of your heart. That if there's any wisdom for us in today's call, in our gathering, I believe it will be found through all of us paying attention to, listening for, and then sharing the sound of the bell of our heart ringing. I wanna cover a fair amount of ground today um, and I wanna move fairly quickly. So I'll mention that the three topics I hope to touch on are firstly, something about what the sacred depths of our life are like. Second, why our ability to live out the meaning and purpose of our life robustly, to offer its service richly and rewardingly depends on our ability to participate in those sacred depths. And then what sourcing the service of our life from those sacred depths asks of us and involves us in as a way of life. So uh, today is Good Friday, and that is a powerful reminder that participating in life's sacred depths and being of service is not about trying to get rid of or smooth over life's troubles or challenges. It's actually about how to relate well with and take good care of them. That participating in life's sacred depths and being of service is actually about how to take good care of what matters most, through taking good care of whatever we're involved in, in such a way that benefits and blesses those we live with and the world we live in. And this is what Christ did on Good Friday. Good Friday was the day he faced his most intense hardships 
But what makes the day good is that he knew how to enter into them willingly in a way that allowed him to be of service to what matters most in such a way that benefited and blessed all of us and the entire world. And this orientation becomes guidance for how to live a good life. Pretty much all world traditions, philosophical and psychological traditions agree that living a good life is about being of service and that being of service is about taking good care of what matters most through the way we take good care of whatever we're involved in in such a way that benefits and blesses those we live with and the world we live in. So let's unpack this a little bit with our three topics, starting with something about what the sacred depths of our life are like. There was a gentleman named Dag Hammarskjöld, and he was one of the first and still most beloved secretary generals of the United Nations. He was also a decorated world economist, and I believe he won a Nobel Peace Prize. So he lived quite a life, um, but he felt very strongly that his ability and anyone's ability to live a good life and to offer the service of their life with excellence depended on our ability to participate in life's sacred depths. And I've selected um, a section of his writings on what the sacred depths of life, what those sacred depths of life are like. So um, I'd like to share that with you now. So this is Dag Hammarskjöld on the sacred depths of life. And he says, God does not die on that day that we cease to believe in a personal deity. God does not die on that day when we cease to believe in a personal deity, but we die on that day when our lives cease to be illuminated by the steady radiance, renewed daily of a wonder, the source of which is beyond all reason. So there's a lot there. And I just wanna say that that shows us that the fabric of our life is sacred that the fabric of our life is sacred right down to its threads, down to the fibers of its threads, that the sacred depths of our life do not depend in any way on whether we do or don't believe in a personal deity, that the sacred depths of our life are just the natural radiance and rhythm of the heart of life itself, beating through our hearts, pitter-patter, tap dance, improvisation, that there's a place where the heart of our life is opening up into the heart of life itself. There's a place where the heart of life itself is pouring out into our heart, that our heart and the heart of life itself are involved in a very intimate and continuous conversation, a very profound relationship. And that if we learn to listen to that conversation and to participate in that relationship, we are empowered with profound wisdom and guidance for how to live a good life and for how to be of service to what matters most. And so at this point, while I'd like to continue looking at what the sacred depths of our life might be like, we're also now exploring why it's imperative that we participate in those sacred depths in order to live out the deep meaning and purpose of our life, in order to offer its service. He says that if we are not participating in those depths, then our lives become impoverished and the service we can offer becomes impoverished. If we're not participating in life's sacred depths, then we're cheating ourselves, we're cheating each other, and we're cheating the world. But when we are participating in those depths, it's the very best thing. And he says, when we are participating in those depths, our lives are ennobled by a vigor and a vitality that allows us to say yes to whatever fate life has in store for us and that we can do that. We can say yes to whatever life has in store for us because when we're participating in life's sacred depths, we are empowered by a wisdom and guidance that allows us to practice being of service to what matters most by taking good care of whatever we're involved in through our very way of relating with and responding to it in such a way that benefits and blesses those we live with and the world we live in. And this gives us a working definition, I think a working definition for what it means to participate in life's sacred depths. It means to practice being of service to what matters most by taking good care of whatever we're involved in through our very way of relating with and responding to it in such a way that benefits and blesses those we live with and the world we live in, that beautifies this moment that benefits future generations, and that offers a genuine blessing. So I would summarize this whole second topic by saying that the sacred depths of our life 
are meant to be the place where the poetry of our core values and guiding principles comes from. That our core values and guiding principles are meant to be our own unique way of expressing life sacred depths as service. That our core values and guiding principles are meant to be our own unique way of being committed to taking good care of what matters most that our core values and guiding principles are not meant to be our strategy for winning at the game of life. They are meant to be our own unique way of being committed to practicing, taking good care of and being of service to the game of life through the way we participate in and play it, through the way we participate in and play it for the love of the game. When I was young, all the sports stars who were my heroes said that they played the game for the love of the game. Now, they all tried to win. They all tried to win as they played the game, but they were all crystal clear that trying to win the game could never be more important than could never eclipse playing the game for the love of the game. Because if it did, it would mean that they had lost their way. They had ceased to be able to live a good life. And so having said that, um, I'd like to say something about our third topic, which is uh, what does living in this way, what does sourcing the service of our life from life's sacred depths ask of us and involve us in? And the first thing I wanna say is that it involves us in the call and craft of cultivating our character. That the call and craft of cultivating our character is one of the best games there is. That it's not selfish or preoccupied, it's actually the foundation for being of service. It's the gateway for benefiting and blessing. And there's a quote that I think speaks to this so eloquently. It's by a gentleman named Christian Alexander, and he's one of the world's foremost architects. He's written many tomes, not just on architecture, but on living a good life. He's always uh, integrating them because when he's talking about building something, he's also talking about the way we compose a life the way we build and structure our lives. So when I read this quote, and he's talking about building something, please think about the way that you build and construct your life, the way you build and cultivate your character. So this is Christian Alexander. And he says, this is a fundamental view of the world. It says that when you build a thing, when you build a thing, you cannot merely build that thing in isolation but must repair the world around it and within it so that the larger world at that one place becomes more coherent and whole. And the thing which you build takes its place in the web of nature as you make it. I think that's beautiful. And of course, the thing you build here is your life and your cultivation of character. Um, I'd say that the second thing, um, or said simply, what this way of life asks of us is service, sacrifice, and deepest satisfaction. That if we're really to be of service, it requires that we invest of ourselves significantly. It requires that we extend and expend ourselves significantly. It requires some kind of sacrifice. But when we source our service from life's sacred depths, then that service and sacrifice are our deepest satisfaction. That if our service doesn't require any sacrifice, then the service may not be sourced in life's sacred depths. And that if we offer a service that does involve sacrifice and isn't our deepest satisfaction, it may also not be sourced in life's sacred depths. This is an important point um, for me. Let me try to illustrate with two brief examples. Um, my altar and the relationship between parents and their children. So I have an altar that is the heart of my home and my life. And everything that composes and populates that altar is something I love dearly. It's actually an embodiment and expression of what I love most dearly. But nothing about that altar is for me to possess exclusively or to own uh, on my own alone. Everything about that altar must eventually be passed on to someone else. And whenever that happens, it involves service, sacrifice, and deepest satisfaction. And I think this also plays out in the relationship between parents and their children. Now for me, to be a parent means that you love your children deeply. Just having children isn't enough. So all parents love their children 
very deeply. But you know, as parents, that in particularly when your children are young, you dictate and determine almost every aspect of their lives. And they depend on you to determine and dictate every aspect of their lives in a way that takes good care of them as an act of service and love, not to dominate or impose your will on them. But you also know that as your children grow up, they slowly and steadily claim more and more of their sovereignty that they claim from you and you give back to them more and more of their ability to determine and dictate the course of their own life in order to liberate them to more freely and fully express the life that is theirs to live, the service that is theirs to offer. But for parents involved in this process or who've completed this process that I've talked to, they all say that it involves service, sacrifice, and deep satisfaction. Now, we're all, we've all been children and we all have parents. Um, so many of us have been through this cycle with our parents and now may be in it with our, with our own children. But if you've been through this with your parents, and particularly if you've had parents who passed away, then you have the opportunity to have discovered that there is a fierce and ferocious bond and love and commitment that exceeds the bounds of life and death that exceeds giving and receiving, but that is almost never discovered or developed without profoundly giving and receiving, without very deeply acting in service, sacrifice, and deep satisfaction. And um, that's something that I hope we all grow in and practice ever more deeply. So, to wrap my comments today, I'd like to offer two bits of poetry. Um, these are evocations for me about what it means to live from the sacred depths of life. They are some of the deepest prayers that my heart is learning to murmur. Um, the first is a fragment from a poem written by Senri Unyu, um, and the second is from Kahal Gibran. Um, Senri was a surgeon in World War II he was actually um, convicted and sentenced to death for a crime he didn't commit. The historical record exonerated him, but only after he'd been executed. This was a bit of poetry he wrote from his prison cell three days before he was to be executed, knowing that he was gonna be executed for a crime he didn't commit. So he had every reason, as much as anyone would, to feel bitter um, and resentful towards life. But I think he gives us a very vivid view of what life looks like when you participate in it from life's sacred depths. And I wanna pair that with something from Kahal Gibran. So this is the first bit from Senri. He says, thanks to lamenting over the pain in the world, I am able to become laughter when my life is happy. And maybe our ability to laugh fully and robustly also requires us to have lamented over the pain in the world. Due to being struck and trampled upon and biting my lips to control my temper, I fully realize how precious it is to be alive. And even if I am intentionally tired of such an ugly world, look, what a beautifully blue sky. And who among us can't be intentionally tired of such an ugly world? But how important is it in the middle of all that to say, look, what a beautifully blue sky. He says, please let me always consider myself by putting myself in another's place without flinching, no matter how hard and heart-renting it is to live in this way. Within silver tears like pearls and laughter like the sun, let's keep walking onward together every day, day after day. Within silver tears like pearls and laughter like the sun, let's keep walking onward together every day, day after day. And for me, it's those silver tears like pearls and laughter like the sun that are one of the hallmarks of living from life's sacred depths. Kahal Gibran, I think, uh, embellishes this quite eloquently when he's talking about those sacred depths and he's talking about uh, the furnace, the threshing room floor of love and what it means to stay on that floor and to live from that place. And he says, all of these things shall love do unto you that you may know the secrets of your heart and in that knowledge become an expression of life's heart. But if in your fear, and we're all afraid, 
But if in your fear, you would seek only love's peace and love's pleasure, because in the middle of being afraid, we don't have to let it determine our relationship with life to that degree. But if in our fear, we seek only love's peace and love's pleasure, then we will have to pass out of love's flushing room floor into a seasonless world where we will laugh, but not all of our laughter, not golden laughter like the sun, and where we will weep, but not all of our tears, not silver tears like pearls. And so my deep prayer for myself and for all of us is please, please let us stay on love's threshing room floor. Please, please let us participate in life's sacred depths. Please, through that service and sacrifice, let us find our deepest satisfaction within silver tears like pearls and laughter like the sun. And let's keep walking onward together every day, day after day. So thank you very much for the gift of your time and your attention. Um, and I hope you heard something ring the bell of your heart. Thank you very much. Yeah, we wanna model the opportunity to really go deeper with your sharing with each other. And so we've asked three of our uh, members of our advanced leadership program community that Vid is the leader of to just model what it, what it, what it not just looks like or hear what, how, what you hear, but what you feel in the quality of the way in which you have the opportunity to respond in relationship to each other. We're gonna go with Michelle Kinder and then Haley Rushing and then Eric Harrington. So, um, so Michelle, you have an opportunity now. Thank you, Randy. And thank you so much, Vid. I appreciated the instruction you gave us about listening to what was the bell of your heart ringing. Um, and so much of what you said landed. And I, I was so grateful to Rand that we're getting to listen to you today. But the thing that jumped the most into my own heart is your comment about living out of the sacred depths is not about avoiding, it is the serving. And I feel like the circumstances we're living in right now have sort of wiped out so many of the things that distracted me from the sacred depths. And now my work is to change my relationship with fear and stress so that I can take full advantage of this time um, and transmute it into service. And I'll just share one thing that I'm looking at um, right in front of me. And as Vid was talking, it just feels so connected. And it's uh, from Alana Fairchild. She says, um, I revise anything inside of me that will hold me back from owning my spiritual power and moving ahead in my divine destiny. Thank you, Vid. Thank you, Rand. The thing that landed for me was just framing everything within the Good Friday context. For me, what kind of came up is this idea that love in our lives is routinely crucified in different ways. Like, like life is suffering. We can feel abandoned by love. We can feel like we've been forsaken by love through life circumstances. But there's always an opportunity for love to be resurrected. And whether it will be resurrected or not is usually a function of our own capacity for growth. How much capacity do we have to take the circumstances that we're presented with and use them as grist for the mill and for our own development so that we can choose to resurrect love in our life and pass it on and pass it on to others versus crucifying love or sacrificing love or not being um, a part of just resurrecting love in our lives <laughs> and paying it forward and uh, of service to the people in our lives. So I thought you, you, you said that a lot better than I did, but that's how I like the idea of how do we take the pain and suffering that we're presented with and use all the capacity and wherewithal that we have to ensure that love's always resurrected. The, 
and it's so great to see you all, was uh, there were three things. One was to, it was basically an invitation to your heart to see what bells were rung. Uh, the second was to notice the sacred depths of uh, your relationship, the sacred depths of your leadership. And the third thing was how does that involve us? Um, to share how I felt, two things. One is in my relationship to Vid uh, and to you all, which is kind of like two pebbles or two rocks at the bottom of a body of water bumping up against each other has its own quality. And when I'm with Vid, I feel that. But in this context, I can literally feel like a river, the energy rushing through is I feel all of y'all here with me. And that has its own quality. Um, and then there's also how I relate to the content of what he said specifically, how is it touching the sacred depths of my relationship to leadership? And what I've noticed is, or tr what I've been trying to notice uh, is how often my feelings of self-preservation come up versus me touching uh, into being present to the other, being present to myself versus being present to the other. Um, if I was to extend a consideration uh, to Vid or to the group, uh, it would be how can you feel the universe experiencing you during this time? What does the quality of your mirror look like? when you look into the mirror, how are those things changing? Thank you. Thank you, Eric. And as a, uh, as just appreciation for, for Michelle and Haley and Eric, I want to appreciate this, this concept of where are we sourcing our leadership from? And many of you know that we at Stegen have a, a way of making sense of this these leadership dimensions of the head, the heart, and the gut. The gut can be thought of as the body. And so not just sourcing our leadership from our, from our mind, which, which for me, especially right now, I tend to notice I have this bias to want to conceptualize and want to solve problems. And I want to figure out how to lead from up here, which is, which is not wrong. It's just, um, it's just partial. And sometimes it's not the best place to be sourcing from. And there are other opportunities that we can source from our, from our emotions, from our hearts, the head, the heart. And yet there are other times I felt from all three of those reflections, something in the body, something deeper that Vid was inviting us into our own depths of can we learn to listen to what our body is telling us, even if we're afraid? And can we use that to inform and to source how we lead and how we serve and how we relate to others? I was, I was sharing first appreciation that you asked us to listen to the bell uh, that was rung in our heart because I tend to intellectualize a lot of the sermon that I hear from you and I do consider it sermon. Um, and, uh, and so in listening and feeling what I felt in this moment was, and I shared with the group was, was two things. One was longing and the other was calling. Uh, and the longing was for a connection to higher purpose in this moment as you called it was not meant to be a call to action, rather a call to devotion, but I felt a call to action to find law, to find purpose, connect to purpose and be with purpose. And, uh, and so those were the, the feelings that I resonated in my heart and I just wanted to share that with you. So thank you so much. Thank you, Harpreet, beautiful. And, uh, and, with, uh, and with that, on behalf of the entire state and community, I wanna thank everyone who was here live. Uh, this, is, uh, this is rich, this is important. And those that are um, that are on the recording, um, thank you for spending your time with us.